Welcome, welcome to our discussion program, Studio 58A, live here at the Jamaica Information Service. I'm your host, Andrew James Soyes. Thanks to everyone for joining us for today's program. As you watch, remember to send in your questions and comments so we can put them to our guests and share this video with a friend. Now, according to entrepreneur.com, if you don't have a powerful and visible personal brand, you are putting yourself at a disadvantage in almost every aspect of your professional, business, and personal life. To give us the 411 on personal branding today is lead PR chick and personal branding coach Naomi Garrick. Thanks so much for stopping by, Naomi. Thank you, Andrew. I'm really excited to be here. And we're very glad to have you. Okay. Now, before I jump into the whole matter of personal branding, sure. I would like to find out more about your brand. That's Lead PR Chick. But what does that mean? <laughs> so Lead PR Chick is really our way of referring to a PR officer. Or for me, I'm the Lead PR Chick, so I'm the CEO of Garrett okay. Communications, which is my public Garrett relations Garrett agency. Um, a couple years ago, we decided to be very intentional about how we positioned our brand for the company. We have our signature colors, it's pink, black, and white. And because we've mostly had females working at our company, some of our clients started actually referring to us as their PR chicks. And it's something that stuck with us. And so we decided to make a brand out of it. So when people apply for a job at Garrett Communications, they actually say, I'm applying for a job to be a PR chick. And for the gentlemen, we actually say PR chuck. And we have a blue bird for the Chuck as well. So the Chuck is blue and he has glasses and a little tie. So he's still looking, you know, chic and suave. But for the girls, for the women, it's PR Chic and we have our PR Chic icon and that's on all of our promotional material for Garrett Communications. So it's just another way for us to differentiate our brand from other PR practitioners in the industry. Okay, nice, nice. So what exactly is personal branding? Okay, so personal branding, you know, it may seem like it's a very new thing, like it's this new buzzword and everybody is trying to discover what their personal brand is. But we all have a personal brand and it's really us being our most authentic selves, you know, being our best selves at all times. The personal brand is a couple of different things. It's how you see yourself, but what's also is important is how does the world see you? So what do others say about you when you're not in the room? And even more so now, why the personal brand is becoming so much more important or more relevant is because it's now also what Google has to say about you. So someone is going to be introduced to what they believe is your personal brand by doing a simple Google search before they even get to actually meet you. And now the world has access to your brand. So because the world has access to your brand, it's easier for them to reach you or to see what's currently available about you. And so it's very important for us to now be aware of how we're showing up in our online spaces and not just our personal, you know, face-to-face -face interactions because sometimes an individual will meet you online first without actually really meeting you. And just based on what they see, whether it's on a Google search or on your Instagram page or your social media platforms, LinkedIn, that is the perception that they're going to leave with about your brand. And it could be great or it could be not so great depending on how you're using those platforms. Okay, I actually love that you touched on LinkedIn because <laughs> based on based on research and um, some of the information that you've been sharing, mm -hmm. your content on your social media platforms, you've been stressing the importance of LinkedIn. So yes. I'd love for you to talk a bit more about that because it's it's a very important platform, but persons, I don't think necessarily see or know much about how so, important it so is. it's an extremely important platform but I have found just through experiences with clients and other individuals my peers we underutilize the LinkedIn platform but so for those who don't really know LinkedIn LinkedIn is really the I would say the social media channel for people that are serious about business so that's where business professionals hang out um, it gives you an opportunity to showcase who you are in a professional capacity and for others to find you online depending on what they're looking for in terms of a skill or service and with LinkedIn what I find here especially in Jamaica well globally there are over 500 million users so people are getting jobs leads new clients just by being engaging and interactive on their LinkedIn page in Jamaica I find that we still use LinkedIn as a resume holder almost like an online resume holder which we don't update frequently. So maybe the last time you updated your LinkedIn page was two years ago and you have a new job and it still has the old job. 
So someone that's looking for you in your current capacity may not even find you just because it's not updated. And we tend to start with what our job title is and not what we do. So you started asking me what's a PR chick. So if you don't know what a PR chick is, me putting lead PR chick without explaining what that means doesn't mean anything to someone that's looking for maybe a public relations consultant. So I have to include the public relations part in whatever I do. So for example, on my LinkedIn, on your LinkedIn page, you have your profile headshot, which is the first thing people see. So I always recommend that you get a professional headshot done. Um, it's a visual representation of your brand. It's the first thing someone sees. And then there's a headline statement. And on that headline statement, that's where people will put, what I see people would put is their job title. So I am the CEO of this, or I'm an account executive here, or I'm a financial analyst here, or an IT practitioner here. But that doesn't tell me what is the value that you bring or the problem that you solve. So for example, on my LinkedIn platform, it will say something like, I help professionals, entrepreneurs, and executives to stand out in a noisy world by getting clarity on their personal brand. And so even if I put personal branding coach, I explain what that is, what is the problem I solve. And so that's what I encourage individuals to do. And then you use your summary to actually know, talk more about the value that you bring, not to list your skill sets that would be in your resume, because there's a place for that on LinkedIn. You can do that in the experiences part. Um, but we tend to use it to put, we stack all of our skills and we're still not telling someone what's the problem that I solve for you. What's the value that I'm going to bring to your business or your organization? So it's not really supposed to be about us. It's supposed to be how we can help you. But in, it's not just about updating the profile, which is really a very important part of it. But in the same way we engage with people on Instagram and Facebook and Snapchat, you have to be engaging on LinkedIn. You have to be following the right companies, following the right people, commenting on things related to your field or your industry. Because what you're doing is creating your own social proof online. Because sometimes we say we're somebody on paper, like a resume. But then when you search for that person, because that's what we all do now, when we meet someone and we want to learn more, we're going to do a search. If I can't find you in this capacity online, then it means you don't have social proof of what you do. So it's very important to start doing that. And I find now that even in Jamaica, before a job for some companies is even placed in the newspapers, they're already doing their recruitment process through LinkedIn because they're able to search for exactly who they're looking for and they can get all the information online. And then they'll probably follow up with additional search results on Google. But if you are not even playing in that space, then you're not even being considered for an opportunity. So that's why I think LinkedIn is such an important and powerful platform for any kind of business professional. It doesn't matter if you're an entrepreneur, if you are a business owner, if you are the CEO of a company, or if you are just starting out, you are about to graduate from university. I do a lot of workshops for um, university students and I always tell them, if you leave it one thing from this session, sign up for LinkedIn and start being active so that people can find you when they're looking for your industry or area of expertise. Okay. How else can someone strengthen their personal brand? Okay, so it's a couple of things. So in my workbook, which you have here, um, eight steps to building your personal brand, I go through eight basic steps that you can start using to start building your personal brand. But I like to start with a three-step approach, which is about clarity, value, and communication. So the first thing you have to do is be clear on who you are. If you don't know who you are, then how are you going to communicate that to the rest of the world? Or how do you expect others to relate to you if, if you can't even clearly communicate that? So when I say getting clarity on who you are, I really mean things like, what are you passionate about? What are some of your core values? What are your professional and personal goals? What's your driving force? What's the thing that gets you up in the morning? Um, because when you have an idea of that, then you start to align yourselves with the opportunities related to who you are and your goals. And so you don't end up choosing a job that you know that you're going to be unhappy in because it has nothing to do with who you are as an individual. So you want to start with just getting clarity on you. And then you want to start thinking about what is your unique value? What is that unique thing that through my experiences and my own personal journey as a business person or just an individual 
that adds value to somebody else, that allows me to be a little bit different or a lot different from somebody else in my area of expertise. But you have to understand that value. So what I would usually recommend is that for my clients that I coach, I tell them to create two things a personal brand mission statement. So in the same way that a company has a mission statement for their business that really talks about, you know, what are the core values of the company? What's the vision? What's the mission? You should have one for your life. And you use that because now when you're introducing yourself to someone, you can actually use your personal brand mission statement as a part of your introduction. And then I go a step further with the personal brand pitch. And it's just like how startup companies would have an elevator pitch where they have to pitch the business in less than five minutes. And in that pitch, they should, the investor or potential investor should get a sense of what the business is, why they should invest. And by the time you're finished, they should want to learn more about it. And so what I recommend is that you do your own personal brand pitch by starting with who you are, because you need to communicate that first, and what you do. So I find that when we network and we introduce ourselves to people, just like the LinkedIn page, we start with, Hi, I'm Naomi and I am the lead PR chick at Gary Communications. What does that mean? What is Gary Communications? What's a PR chick anyway? And so you have to start with what do you do? You know, I help professionals to get clarity on who they are, understand their values so that they can clearly communicate with their ideal target audience so that they can stand out in a noisy world and start getting paid for their expertise. That's what I do. So immediately you know the value that I'm going to bring to your life if you come to a workshop or if you do coaching or one of my challenges. And so it's about getting clarity, understanding that value so that you can communicate it efficiently and effectively with your ideal target audience. Because we all have an audience that we're trying to reach, but you have to know who that is. Because then if you don't know, then you're just talking to everybody and everybody is not your audience. So it's about getting clarity on that ideal audience. And when you know that, then you know the places that you need to be. You know where you need to show up. You know how to show up online and where you should be showing up online, what platforms to use and how to use them. Because you know where your audience is and you know now how to reach them. So it's clarity, value, and communication. And so that's the overarching theme for the eight steps to building your personal brand. But in the workbook, I go through eight basic steps. And so the first one is, who am I? And we started that in clarity. You have to get clarity on who you are. Second step is, um, it's not what makes me unique, but it's something like that. Ah, defining your personal brand. Thank God we have the workbook here. So step two is about defining your personal brand. And that really speaks to what is the value that you bring to the table? What's your area of expertise? Um, what do you want to be known for? So that's what I'd ask my clients. What is the one thing that you want to be known for as an expert. And then I go through a couple of other steps. So step three is about mirroring your mentor because I believe mentorship is super important because with a mentor, it helps to fast track you almost through life when you have the right mentor because you get to learn from their experiences, you learn from their mistakes. So if you're in an industry and you actually want to be better in that industry or learn the ins and outs or some of the things to expect, Find a mentor in your industry that could help to guide you. You know, the, the question I get is that some people say, well, I don't know, um, I'd like this person to be my mentor, but I don't really know them. Your mentor doesn't have to be a physical person that you communicate with. Your mentor could actually be someone in your online community that you still don't really know very well, but you have the oppor opportunity to connect with them because we have the opportunity to connect with the world online. So you can either read their biographies, listen to their audiobooks, follow them on social media, and you learn the lessons. So I have a lot of virtual mentors. I could say I say all the time that Oprah is my mentor. I don't know her personally, but I listen to Super Soul Sundays. I listen to her podcast. I follow her stories. Hopefully one day I'll go to one of our conferences, but I'm always learning from her. And so you need to identify those mentors in your life. So another thing I would recommend is create your own personal brand advisory board. So with that, you're looking at the areas in your life that you need a little bit or even a lot of help with. So it could be not just your business, it could be personal, it could be relationships, it could be your faith, it could be health, it could be fitness, it could be wealth creation. And find those people, whether it's a virtual person or a real person that you can actually help to guide you. So just like how a company has their own board of directors, they're mm -hmm. all 
individuals, that, you know, with their own expertise that don't work at the company, um, but they bring their knowledge and value to the CEO or managing director to guide them with what they're doing with the day-to-day -day running of the company. And they're accountable. They're held accountable as well. It's the same thing with your mentors. So you pick those people who can advise you. You create your own circle of genius. That's what I'd recommend. <laughs> and right. Step four. Step four, which this is what I talk about a lot now. It says reputation matters on and offline. If I do a reprint, it's really just going to be online because that is where, you know, it, this quote I always use, it says um, by Warren Buffett, it takes 20 years to build a reputation and only five minutes to ruin it. And if you think about that, you do things differently. But now with digital media and, you know, it's just so fast. You can really lose your reputation in seconds just with a screenshot, with a photo, by commenting on a post, liking something that maybe someone else deems inappropriate. And so now you have to be so much more mindful of how you're putting out your brand in this online space because everything you do or share online, you're not, you are now creating a digital footprint for your brand for the rest of the world to see about you. And maybe that isn't really who you are, but that what, that's what you have out available for them. Mm -hmm. So they're going to make a judgment before they even get the pleasure to actually meet you just because of what is available. So it's very important to start guarding and protecting how you are showing up in that online space because more than likely that's what people will see first before they even get to meet you. That so, that's, so that's super, super important for me. So there's actually a quote in the workbook that says, evidence supports the importance of the personal brand. 65% of all internet users trust online search as the most important source of information about people and companies. So people are trusting what they see online first before they even get to meet and interact with you. So we can all do that. You can start by doing a social media cleanse mm -hmm. because sometimes we post things, you know, maybe years ago and we forget that we actually posted this thing. And then five years later, it comes up in something, whether it's an interview, because believe it or not, companies now ask to have access to your social media so they can see how you're showing up online. Because you are now not only representing that comp your brand, but you're representing that company's brand. Once you work for somebody, you know are a part of their brand. So you have to be aware of how you're showing up in your online spaces. Step five is about getting connected. So this is the art of purposeful networking. And I find that when people hear networking, it's normally like, Oh, I hate going to this event. I don't want to go to another networking event and meet people. And so it feels like a chore instead of an opportunity. And I believe that every networking event is an opportunity. And sometimes we think networking and we just think an event, not realizing that we are all a part of various networks just in our own spaces. So we're here at the JS right now. The JS is a big, massive network of individuals. Um, so you start making those connections in your existing networks first your family, your church, organizations that you're a part of, your friends. When I do different workshops and I realize that I ask the question about networking and people immediately think going to an event. And then when I say, you know, how many people in your circle of friends or in your company or anybody else knows about your side hustle? How many people know about all the other things that you do and the other ways that you bring value to a space if you don't tell them? So you have to start with the immediate network first because there are opportunities there waiting for you that you don't even know about. And then there's a networking where you're now outside of your space and you're now connecting with other individuals that, you know, it could be an organization that you need to join or a conference that you need to start attending or you need to identify people you need to connect with. But what I recommend is that when you're trying to connect or meet new people, you have to start with a human touch. And when I say human touch, I mean that sometimes we go straight to the person like ready to ask them for something. Like a and sales pitch. Like a sales pitch. And people mm -hmm. sense that. And so they're already kind of like, oh, God, I don't want to talk to this person. Right. So they're already on the defensive already and they kind of just want it to end. But instead, it's about really getting to know the person. So like when I go out to an event, I try to do a little research first. I know the event I'm going to. I have an idea of who might be there. And I try to think, who do I need to connect with or who do I think I can bring value to when I get to this space? And so I want to connect with this person on a meaningful level. So I want to get to know a little bit more about them. What do they like? Maybe our children are the same ages. How can I start a conversation that's not about work? So that's what I start thinking through first. So that when I connect with them, it's like 
we are starting to build our own relationship. And the acts will come later. Maybe will come naturally in the conversation later, but I don't start with, hey, I'm Naomi Garrick, and I think I can definitely help you to build your brand or build your company or give you exposure. No, I want to have a real conversation. And relationships is something that's very important for me. And even for our company, Garrick Communications, we are going to be 10 in October, and we've never advertised our business. It has always been through relationships, referrals, um, recommendations and the results of our company. And so relationships is one of our core values at Garrett Communications because it makes a big difference in how people relate to you and how you engage with the different people that are in your different spaces. So I always say for networking, start with start with the human touch. Like we all want to feel connected to someone. So start by trying to connect in a real way and not just asking for things. And see how you can bring value to the person. So instead of just going to ask somebody Hey, can you be my mentor? No. Tell me a little bit about yourself. Tell me about, you might see something basic. If you want me to be my, your mentor, you must know some stuff about me. And you may see a gap in what I do. I think if the approach is, you know, Naomi, I've been following you for a while and I noticed that your social media could be doing a lot better if you did this. Already I like you because you're trying to help me. So you need to think about how can you help the person that you're trying to connect with. I think that's a great way to start. Okay, so before I move on yes. to, to step six, yes. Naomi, we want to show some love and connect with our online awesome. viewers. So we have Jazeel Clark. Hi, Jazeel. He says, good being here as usual, always informative. Awesome. Jen Wright says, Naomi, you are always giving great <laughs> insights. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, we have a question from... Vaughn Davis. Okay. So he says, what are some tips to help people bounce back from a Is situation? That Vaughn yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's yes. Hilarious. Vaughn says, Hi Vaughn. <laughs> So his question is, what are some tips to help people bounce back from a situation that made them or their company look bad? Oh wow. So that okay. So that's a combination of things. So one thing I am also in my, as my, a part of my PR practice is I am a certified reputation champion. So I actually did a program with the Public Relations Society of America. And so what we do is we actually help to mitigate crisis before it happens. So what we want to do is we don't want to get to that stage where the crisis happens and you don't know what to do. So for a company or an individual, you should know what are some of the possible red flags that could happen for you. And you need to start thinking about what, what would you do in that situation? So you start with a plan before the crisis happens. Um, so that's usually what I recommend. But what I find is with, as it relates to an individual, because you know, as I said, with social media, things happen. Um, and one of the things I think is critical to any kind of crisis is time. How quickly you respond to a situation. And so what I always recommend is that you need to be ahead of the story, right? You don't want the story to develop without you being a part of the conversation, which is what happens a lot. So when there's a crisis, even with a company, and the media is trying to reach you and your response is no comment, then they immediately start to think on the negative. What are they trying to hide? Why do they have no comment for me? And then they'll start to create stories based on the information that they do have without you even playing a part in that. So the first thing I would say is that you have to respond very quickly as soon as it happens. So acknowledge the situation, whether you are wrong or right, we don't know yet, but acknowledge that it has happened and that you are going to have a response within 24 hours. Just to even at least give you time to say that I've addressed it, I've acknowledged it, and these are the steps I'm gonna take. Um, I've seen many situations here in Jamaica where crisis has been managed extremely well. I think even that King Alarm situation that happened last year was done very well um, by John Azar and his team um, because we knew what was happening every step of the way. So there was no point where you had to be like, how come we don't hear anything? Where's the update? How come we didn't get the tapes? Like you knew what was happening. And so it's very important to be open and honest because with digital media now, we can find out the information quickly. So you want to ensure that you address the situation immediately and that you um, provide information on what are the next steps to that you are taking and how you'll be updating the general population about what is happening. So I don't know if that really answered your question, Vaughn, because I went off on a lot of different things. Um, but for any kind of crisis communication, it is about responding in a very 
timely manner, presenting the facts and the next steps and how you're going to address it. Okay, we have another question here for you, Naomi. Sure. Do people need a website to build a personal brand? This is coming from Andre Palmer. Hey, Andre Palmer. So you don't need one, but it, it helps. And let me tell you why it helps. The more content that you're producing for yourself online, you are helping Google to find you. And so when you allow Google to just search for whatever everybody else is sharing about you, then you can't guarantee what's going to come up. So for example, if you were working at a company 10 years ago and they haven't updated their website, then you're still coming up as one of their executives on their company page just because they haven't updated it, which can confuse your audience if that's not the role that you're in right now. And so because you can now create your own website for free, um, so I actually created my own website myself, and I'm not a techie by any kind of means, but I followed the steps that Wix.com gave me. And I was able to create my own website, and it, to me, it looks very professional. You can visit IamNaomiGarrick.com. Um, but that's what I use, and now when you do a Google search for me, my website comes up above anything else that's there. Okay. So I think a website is a good tool to help you with your online presence, but you don't have to do it. But I would say if it's for free and you can do it, why not do it? Because on that platform, at least you can have updated pictures and updated bio and updated information about what you actually do and the value that you bring. So I recommend it, um, but you don't have to do it. But if you don't do a website, at least do LinkedIn or Facebook or have a, have a good engaging Instagram platform that's not just about the lifestyle side of your life unless you are in the lifestyle business but it's also about what you do use the instagram like a website which is what we don't do okay we have another question coming in sure this is from tino yes okay can you hi tino can you tell me the question it hasn't come up on What does someone need to do as a that's to be a PR agent for an entertainer or athlete? Okay, oh, that's interesting. Um, well, we don't do we are not publicists. So when I started in PR, that's actually how I started. I actually was a publicist for entertainers because I worked at RETV, Reg Entertainment Television, at the time. And we interacted with a lot of entertainers. And I was approached to be a publicist for an artist. And that just grew into being a publicist for many artists. Um, so nowadays, I'm not really sure what you do. My PR journey was very different. I didn't study public relations. I actually studied hospitality and tourism management. Um, Interesting. Yeah, that's what I studied. Okay. But I worked in media through RETV for almost five years, sales and marketing manager. And then before that, I was in the hospitality industry, but always in sales and marketing. And so because I worked in media, I, as I said earlier, relationships are super important. I developed very key relationships with the media industry. So the people behind the scenes, the decision makers, the producers, the editors. And it gave me an idea of what people wanted to see in terms of information. Like what would they actually publish? Who's an interview? What would they want for an interview? So I started thinking from the publicist side, but with the mind of someone in the media industry. So even when I'm writing a press release at that time, I'm thinking, what would I pick up in a press release and want to actually write about? And so because I had that experience behind the scenes and I also used to write for the Teenage Observer, so I had writing skills. I loved um, languages and literature. If I, if I didn't do hospitality, I would be a literature teacher probably. And so I combined those two things, my experiences. And that really gave me a head start into the PR industry because I had the relationships with the artists. I had the relationships with the media. And I knew behind the scenes how to create or craft information that would be of value to an editor or to a producer or someone that, you know, is, is actually the decision maker, the gatekeeper to get my client out in the public space. Okay. Okay. So we have uh, another comment. Sure. Okay. So we'll be sharing the book with you in a few moments. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll just um, share this comment with Naomi. 
This is coming from Paul C. Distant. Okay. He says, just her personality will lead me to research her. Very <laughs> professional presentation <laughs> and delivery. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Um, the PR, so the PR Chicks Guide um, here in Jamaica, it's available at Fontana Pharmacy. This is it. Yes. That's me. <laughs> <laughs> so it's available at Fontana Pharmacy. Oh, oh sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, okay, sorry. let's hold so it up a little longer. You tell us when to put it down. So it's available at Fontana Pharmacy and it's also available on Amazon.com. So on Amazon.com, I also actually have three books. So I have the PR Chicks Guide, which is the workbook, which I think is very important for anyone that really wants to get a head start on building their personal brand. Um, and why I did it as a workbook is because I think that when you write things down, it's you become a little bit more intentional about what you're doing. So it's almost like a written vision board for your brand. So you can go in, you can change things, you can update it. So it's guided questions to help you to really start thinking about how you're building your own personal brand and how you're communicating it with your ideal audience. And then what I did was a pocket version, which is the PR Chicks mini guide, mm -hmm. eight steps to building your personal brand, which has the basic guidelines, but the workbook is what's recommended really. Okay. I find that people buy both because they keep the pocket guide in their bag. So if they need to refer to certain things like dress code, then that's in there. And then I did one specifically for a younger audience, which is Be a Unicorn. And it's an interactive journal on how to stand out in a noisy world by simply being you. Especially, as I said, you know, with this world of social media, a lot of our young people are struggling to be who they are not because of what they see online. And so this journal is to just to remind you that everything you have or everything you want is within you. And you have to just realize that you are your brand and you just being your best self is good enough. Yes, I agree. We have another question from sure. Andre Palmer. What are the types of content that person should put out to build their personal brand? Okay, so there are different kinds of content. Content. So you have to think about what does your audience want from you? So I think that's the first thing and that's, that goes back to the clarity, right? What does your audience want from you and what do you have to share with your audience? So it could be, I find that people want to know you, the individual. So you can share content about yourself that you're willing to be in the public space, right? So your audience wants to feel connected. It's all about connection. They want to feel like they are actually really a part of everything that you do. So that's why a lot of influencers will put like behind the scenes. Um, I mean, when this interview is finished, I'm recording as well. So I'm going to share it with my audience and I will post a picture of me in the studio so that they can see what's happening behind the scenes and not just the final product. Um, and then you can also show your knowledge and expertise. So if you are an expert in any industry, you want people to know that you're the expert in the industry. So you want people to see you on the job. You want people to see you doing what you do best. You want to share content and some value and some information about what you do. Like if you are a videographer, maybe there's a, like, a secret tip that you know that your other videographer friends don't know, don't know, and you can share that as value to your audience. So it's really about thinking about what can I share that will help the people that follow me? Right. Okay. So you are positioning yourself as an expert in your industry. And I'll tell people, even with LinkedIn, I would recommend writing articles. But maybe you're not such a great article. That's not your thing. You don't have the time. That's fine. There are tons of people writing articles about your area of expertise. Why not share one of their stories and then still put your comments on it so that you're sharing what your thought process is around what you're sharing. And it's still helping to position you as that expert. So you're still providing value even if you didn't write it. So there's different ways. So I definitely think sharing about yourself, um, sharing knowledge and teaching something. And that's why courses are becoming so popular now. Online yes, courses yes. because they're quick and you can learn something. I mean, I even have one right now and it's the Build Your Brand Challenge where you can build a better brand in just 14 days. And with that, I send out 14 emails, 14 videos. Um, you will get on group coaching calls online in our Facebook community. And you get worksheets that you have to complete. But by the end of the 14 days, you should be better to building a better brand for yourself. So that's the um, BYB14dayChallenge.com for those interested. If you follow me at the PR Chick, you can just click the link in my bio for information on Instagram. But that's what people are doing. People, we are in, we're growing up in this area of the knowledge-based industry, which they say that by 2025 is going to be a US $1.5 billion a day industry because people are looking for knowledge outside of the classroom or outside of the traditional classroom. 
So think about your expertise and what is the knowledge that you have to share or can share with your audience. Okay, but suppose you don't consider yourself to be an expert. Maybe you don't, maybe you don't think you're an expert, but maybe you really are. So what you have to look at is what are the things that you love to do? What are the things that people always ask you about? So it could be not, it doesn't have to be like a set profession, you know, like for example, suppose you watch every single football match, you know all the stats, you know everything. So when people want to know the score, you're the first person they're calling. You're, you, that, that could be considered to be an expert sports analyst. Even though you didn't study that, that's what you do because people are already asking you for that. So when you find out what you have an idea or you're the expert in or you'd like to be the expert in, you start adding value to you. And that's where investing in yourself comes in because you want to start now, okay, if you pinpointed this thing as what you think you're really great at or people already think you're really great at it, how are you going to be the best in that space? And so like what I would recommend to my clients is you want to create a niche within your niche industry. So you don't want to be just okay being in the same space with everybody else. What is that thing about you that's going to give you the edge above somebody else that's in your space? So like for university students, a lot of people are graduating right now. That's fantastic. But what happens when you go into the job interview and you see six of your peers waiting behind you to do the same exact interview and you all study the same exact thing? What are you going to say in your interview that's going to make you get that job? Can't be the same degree. You all have the same degree. That's where personal branding comes in. You have to start thinking about what are your unique qualities from your own experience because we all have our own unique journey and experiences that we're living that nobody else has. So you may have studied, maybe you studied hospitality management and you left with your degree in hotel and tourism management, but you are just really, really great at numbers and accounting. So maybe you are trying to look at a role that is specific to that area of expertise combined with your hospitality knowledge. So it's looking at combining skills as well and not just being satisfied with having one set skill or one set degree. Get your degree and still do some additional online courses or do some other short courses that can now add value to what you already know. So you continue to build on the expertise that you currently have so that you're always better or the best in your area or you end up creating a class for yourself because nobody else is doing what you're doing right, right. and that way you actually get to pay you get people who pay you for that as well because who are they going to compare you to you're the only person they can go to for that particular <laughs> thing so that's what you kind of want it's almost like you want to create your own job category okay so find the niche within your niche industry so that you are being paid for the expert or being for being the expert that you are. All right, we have another question. Sure. From Dante Matthews. Hi, Dante Matthews. What's your advice for someone studying PR and wants to take the knowledge and branch out into a business? Okay, meaning like to start an agency. So my qu so let me just go with what you have. If you so you're studying PR and you want to. Take the, take the knowledge and, and branch, branch out, out into, into a business. business. So you okay. want to be like a that's, CEO. That's fine. But are you ready to branch out into a business just from studying PR? What is going to make you different from Garrett Communications or DRT Communications or Market Me or Pro Communications or any of the other PR or communications firms that are currently existing in Jamaica? That's what you have to think about. You have to find out what is going to be your differentiator in the industry so that you're going to stand out when you get there. So you start working on that from now. What is the, when we started Garrett Communi when I started Garrett Communications, we did everything. So we did every kind of PR: entertainment, lifestyle, news, sports, education, arts. You name it, we did it. But over time, we realized that as much as we could do all of these things, we weren't great in all of those areas. And so we've niched down to the point where are we know that we are the experts in lifestyle PR. So we do lifestyle and business. Those are the two branches of PR that we focus on. Can we do a general news release? Of course we can. Can we do sports events and activities? Sure we can. Entertainment, same. But that's not what we love to do. And so we focus more on what we love to do. And now we attract the clients that need those specific services. And so that's what I recommend. So even in our industry, my PR colleagues, I refer to them as collaborators and not competitors or competition because we all specialize in something different. 
So if I know I get an opportunity to do a project that's not aligned with what we offer from Garrett Communications, I'm not going to take the opportunity just for the money. I'm going to refer them to one of my colleagues who I think will do a much better job at that particular um, event or activation for the client. And they do the same with me. If they know that they're not strong in lifestyle, they'll either partner with us or they will send the client over to us directly. So I definitely believe there's enough for everybody, but you have to still find out what is your one thing. What do you want to be known for when you have your agency? Okay. We have a comment. Sure. From M. LaFay. Hi, M. LaFay. M. LaFay says, I am very happy I am viewing this program today. I didn't quite get the importance of branding for a long time. Now I am thinking seriously of reopening my floral business. Oh, awesome. And taking myself more seriously this time. Great. That's awesome. And use your online um, opportunities to market that. Everybody loves flowers. They yes. love getting flowers. Oh, yes. Beautiful. And just <laughs> beautiful. And ML Faye went on to say, Miss Pierre Chick herself, Naomi, is excellent in her delivery of the information. She's imparting such confidence and professionalism yet friendly oh thank, thank you. you so much thank you thank you I and i that. will follow the link and get the book as well is is that vaughn saying <laughs> no no not vaughn we have another no, comment I, from vaughn i see vaughn say hello again Naomi. <laughs> <laughs> so for those viewers out there vaughn is actually here in this room <laughs> behind the glass mirror i wish we could turn the camera around so that you could see him but it's fine <laughs> okay what is hello vaughn so, what are you asking? <laughs> Vaughn says, what about the importance of soft skills? Oh, very important question, oh. Vaughn. Soft skills in building a brand. Absolutely. Soft skills are super important. So I'll just give an example about soft skills. So let's say, um, I'm sure we've all had that experience, whether in school or someone's applying for a job and you or someone else has all the qualifications, right, that they ask for on paper. However... Someone else applies for the same job and maybe they don't have all the qualifications, maybe they don't even have the degree. And they end up walking away with that job. You know why? Because that's because of their personal brand. It's because of those other soft skills that they bring to the table. Maybe it's how they show up. Maybe it's how they dress for the interview. Maybe it's the confidence that they displayed. Maybe it's the rapport that they had with the person in the interview. And maybe it's the other additional skills we're talking about that you may not have on your resume, but you showcase in how you show up. And guess what? You see, at the end of the day, people like to work with who they like. It's as simple as that. In Jamaica, we talk about your spirit don't take to somebody. It's a real thing. You want to work with, nobody wants to work with the miserable, grumpy person, no matter how skilled you are in what you do. So it's about all of the things that make up your personal brand. So just think about it. Would you prefer to work with someone that has a degree that is like miserable all the time and you don't even want to ask them for the report because you know it's going to be a struggle? You prefer to work with someone that has a great personality that you can train. Someone that's trainable and they're excited and willing to learn and still have that awesome personality to go along with it. So those things, soft skills, definitely matter as it relates to your personal brand. Okay, great tip there, Naomi. So we are going to touch on the last three tips, tips yes. before we go. So we're sure. going to be winding down. I and know we're where we were. We were, we're at, at... We're at five. Yeah, tip number five. Oh, we're talking about networking. So we're now at tip number six. Step number six, which is creating your... Oh, you want us to... Do you want... Oh, you wanted the book. <laughs> tip number six, step six, is about creating your own personal style. And why that's important is because you want to know how you're showing up. And we talk about showing up a lot. And when I say showing up, I mean generally showing up, not just how you look. It's just you. So are you always on time? Are you late? Are you responsive? Do you do what you say you're going to do? Do you keep your promises? But then it's also how you show up in terms of your looks because we're human and we judge with what we see first. Right. So we will make a judgment, but it may change when you actually start to get to know or start interacting with the individual. But my thing is that why wouldn't you want to be showing up with your best self at all times? And that's what this is about. It's about creating your signature style. Like, so what is it, you know, how would you define your own personal style? What does that look like? Whose style do you admire and that you'd want to emulate and, you know, maybe start including some of those things in your own look and feel? 
And so there's a quote in the book that says, style is a deeply personal expression of who you are. And every time you dress, you are asserting a part of yourself. And so that's what it's really about. Just being mindful about how you're carrying yourself. And carrying yourself could just be wearing a clean suit, not looking sloppy, right? Because people are going to judge you. And yes, it is unfair. And they say, don't judge a book by its cover. But we are human beings and we do it anyway. So just ensure that you're showing up the way that you believe you need to be showing up, whatever that means for you. And then step seven, dressing for success. I'll show this one because... This one really just has like some traditional dress codes, especially in corporate Jamaica and not just corporate Jamaica, just in general. And why I did the illustrations with the dress codes is because I'll tell you a little story. Now I'm in PR, so I get invited to a lot of corporate events. Um, and a couple of years ago, our company was sponsoring an event and the event was a black tie event. So I know black tie is formal, so I always would wear something long. For some reason, the dress I had planned to wear, I couldn't wear again, and I was looking for a substitute dress. And the dress that I thought would work for the occasion was formal, um, but it wasn't a dress that was all the way down to the floor. It kind of stopped like almost above my, maybe mid-calf, mm -hmm. but it was still a formal dress. I researched on Google, and I saw some celebrities wearing it, so I thought I could wear it too. And I went to the event and I remember I got a call from a colleague of mine in the lifestyle media industry. And she called to say she cannot believe that my company is sponsoring this event and I'm not dressed according to the dress code. And she schooled me on dress codes. And after that, I will never make the mistake again. So when my, newspaper, my picture came out in the newspapers, she actually cropped the image so that you could not see that I was not dressed according to the dress code. Because some people take those things very seriously. And you can be judged based on that, especially if you're with an older audience that's used to adhering to those dress codes. It looks like you're just not serious. And so I wanted to have these illustrations so that my colleagues and my peers can also be aware of what these dress codes are and what they represent. So that when they're representing themselves or a company, they are showing up the way that they need to show up. So like for the men, black tie. I had no idea that, I think a lot of men think black tie just means a black suit and a black tie, right? See my cameraman here nodding and smiling. But black tie for men actually is a tuxedo suit. So it's a tuxedo jacket. And with a tuxedo jacket, the lapels are actually satin. With the tuxedo pants, the pants actually has black satin seams on the side. You have to wear a black bow tie. You have to wear cufflinks. There's this special little white shirt that they wear that has these little ruffles on it. And then you have these little three black buttons that go right below the collar. And then um, you also have to wear your black socks and they say shiny shoes. So like patent leather shoes, mm -hmm. black belt. So there are a lot of things related to a simple dress code that if you don't know, you just don't know. And you'll be the person that shows up at a black tie event in the black jacket and the black skinny tie. Wow. Oh. <laughs> Okay. Oh, oh, you want to see the dress codes again? You want to see the <laughs> Okay. All right, let me open it up for you. All right, so here we have... That's so this tie, is black yes. tie, male and female. And this is formal, male, formal, female. Did you get it? Uh, not okay, quite. One more piece. Again. Here we go. Got it. Then we have... Uh, I think this is business, lounge suit, or cocktail. Yes. Men and women. And then we have business casual, male and female. We, but business casual varies depending on the organization. So at the end of the day, you have to adhere to your organization's dress code. So don't say that Naomi, the PR chick said, you can wear what is in these pages if you work for a company and you are not the boss. Right. So, so we have to research the company. Right. So, so it depends because companies the have their own rules right. as for dress code too. Especially if you don't have a uniform, but they still have rules. And it's like, for me, this is a very, this is, this is me on a normal day for business casual because that's my organization and I get to create my dress codes for my business. But follow the dress codes of the company. And then the last step is really just creating your own personal branding checklist. So when you've done the workbook, you want to go through and see what are the things you need to do. Do you need to update your resume? Do you need to create your LinkedIn profile? Do you need to do professional headshots? Do you need to start networking now and deciding who you're going to connect with in a meaningful way? So you look through the workbook and you start just creating your own checklist of the things that you now need to do. How can you start sharing your knowledge and expertise, not just online, but in your offline communities using traditional media? So for example, 
I just started writing as a contributor to the Jamaica Observer on personal branding for the business section of the Observer because I wanted to also to be not just seen as a thought leader online, but in all the spaces where I can possibly show up, right? And then it also gives me a greater reach for my audience and potential clients for my services. So you want to think about where are all the platforms that you can start showing up on and offline so that you are not just building a bigger and better brand, but you're also adding value to your community by providing them with information that helps to solve their problems. Okay, so we have uh, another comment that we're going to share before we wrap. Sure. This is from Emla Faye. <laughs> Emla Faye is my person. favorite. <laughs> <laughs> Emla Faye says, I'm going to have to get over my privacy issues and really get an online presence in order to be successful. I will work on it. Good. You work on it. I'm glad that was your takeaway from this interview. Okay, so Naomi, we're going to wrap, but sure. before we go... Because I know you had one million questions and I don't think we even <laughs> answered any of them, but I'm sure I must have covered everything in That's what I That's okay. Said. <laughs> you have touched on several of the questions, which is awesome. Uh, we want to... Okay, so we have another question that came in. Can we can we take that one, producer? Okay, great. So we got to go ahead. Okay. So this person, Andre Palmer again, should persons share content every day? Okay. It depends on what you are sharing. So what I would say is don't just don't share content without a content strategy which is, I think, what happens. People want to just share content and there's no thought behind what they're sharing. So they're just sharing random things that are not necessarily related to their brand. Um, I actually have a coach and my coach would tell me that, which sounds scary to me every time she tells me, but she'll tell me that because of what I do and the problems that I solve for my audience, she believes that I should actually be, I should post on Instagram maybe four times a day. I should do a live every single day and I should have at least five Instagram stories running in my feed every day. I'm not there yet, but I'm slowly building out my brand online based on what my audience wants from me. So you need to really think about what you're sharing and who your audience is before you start just posting content just to have something out there every day. Yes, the more you post is the more potential engagement you have um, based on how especially like Instagram's algorithms work but you don't want to be just posting for the sake of posting. You want to have a plan for your brand. That makes sense. All right, yeah. so, so as we wrap now, your final thoughts that you would like to leave with, with our audience. Okay, so my final thought is, we are all walking and talking billboards for our personal brands. What is your billboard going to say about you? Okay, that, that uh, <laughs> food for thought there. <laughs> Food for thought. Was that too serious? No, I think it's needed. <laughs> Get you thinking, really, okay. truly, you know, let it sink in and, and all of that. Awesome. But um, wonderful. That's a wonderful way to, to end our program for today. And we want to just say thank you so much for everyone who tuned into our discussion, especially those of you who sent in questions and comments. We really, really appreciated it. Yes. And if you sent in a question or if you decide to send in a question after we're through, um, we will do our best to get them answered for you. So if you have a question and you didn't get to hear it done, Fret not, we will make sure that we get the questions answered for you. Now, remember, our audience plays a major part in our show. So if there's anyone in particular that you would like to have in studio, let us know and we will do our best to have that person or persons in studio as soon as possible. Now, don't forget to follow us at Facebook, Twitter and we're on Instagram as well, GIS Voice, yes, on Instagram, so that you can see who we'll be having in studio next. And we do this when? Every Thursday, live on Facebook. How are they going to know where to follow you? You didn't say what the handle that was. That is so true. So we are Jamaica Information Service on Facebook, GIS News on Twitter, and GIS Voice on Instagram. Awesome. So we do this, we do this rather every Thursday live on Facebook. And I've been your host, Andrew James Sawyers, and our guest for today, Naomi Garrick, lead PR chick and personal branding coach. Thank you so much again Thank for stopping you. by, Naomi. Don't forget to follow me too at the PR chick on Instagram. Okay. <laughs> Thanks again so much for tuning in and do enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>